Welcome to Thoughts on the Market. I'm Rob Pullin, Morgan Stanley's Head of Utilities and Clean Energy Research in Europe. And I'm Jens Eisenschmidt, Morgan Stanley's Chief Europe Economist. On this special episode of this podcast, we'll be discussing the future of Europe's energy transition, including whether its clean energy goals are realistic and the implications for investors and Europe's broader economy. It's the 30th of August at 10 a.m. in London. Europe has long been a global leader when it comes to greening its economy. Strong societal and political support has bolstered the region's transition to clean sources of energy, with the European Green Deal and Climate Target Plan aiming to reduce CO2 emissions by at least 55% by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050. While substantial progress has been made over the previous decades, the region is now facing several challenges. Jens, can you give us the backdrop to Europe's energy transition and some of what's changed recently? Yes, Rob. I mean, you have explained it already. There are big change targets, climate change related targets to the energy transition that Europe has subscribed to. These targets were in place already before the 24th of February and 22, when we saw the Russian invasion in Ukraine that changed the European energy setup profoundly. Now, why is this important? It's important because these targets were done in sort of a plan that relied on a certain energy source that is no longer existing. So let me give you an example. Let's take Germany, which was anyway already quite progressed in its journey onto increasing the share of renewables in electricity projection. If you take Germany, they have been turning their back on nuclear power generation, which is another source of emission-free power generation, and have embraced as a flex load provider, so as a provider of electricity when renewables are not available to natural gas. Now, this natural gas supply from Russia is no longer available, as we all know. And of course, that implies that the Germans and other member states of the European Union as well have to change the plan by which they transit to a carbon-free economy. And, you know, this is very complicated because it's not only switching one energy source for the other or exchanging one for the other. You also have to look about the infrastructure. You have to see what is essentially giving your energy mix the stability, as I said before, when we don't have sun shining and wind blowing, you need to have a source. There's about the question about storage technologies. It's not entirely independent of the energy sources that you have available. And so the last year provided profound challenge to the way Europe had planned its energy transition. So they have to replan it. And the complexity of that is huge. Essentially, it's something you want ideally plan at the European level in order to harness all the comparative advantages all the countries have. I'll give an example, you have a lot of sun hours in Spain less so in Germany. So ideally you want to put solar for Europe somewhere south and not so much somewhere north. But that of course means something for the grid you have to deploy around it. So all that complexity is huge. All the coordination needs are huge. And so this is the new situation we are in. Yeah, that new situation clearly puts increased pressure on Europe. If electricity prices remain elevated, Europe's large industrial base, and you mentioned Germany, would continue to shoulder this burden. Margins, pricing, competitiveness would all suffer, and the region's place in the global value chain might be at risk. Now, renewables are increasingly cost competitive, but even wind and solar power is still very intermittent, and that requires either a stable baseload or at least flexible generation. And as you mentioned, this previously was facilitated partly by Russian gas. Now, with all that in mind, Jens, how much investment is needed to fund the transition? And is there economic risk associated with this? So the numbers are huge. We have said that number could be around 5 trillion. Other sources estimate this to be slightly higher, but more or less the ballpark is the same. We also know that already 1.4 trillion is earmarked from public funds, so EU budget, meaning that 3.6 are left for the private sector to deploy or for member states to come up from national budgets. So the figure itself, boiling down to somewhere between five to 600 billion a year until at least 2030 and maybe beyond, These figures are not in itself the problem. The problem is how do you, according to which plan do you deploy this? And what is the sort of economic backdrop in which this investment happens? So ideally, from an economist perspective, this is a productivity increasing undertaking. And if it's done in that way, it won't be necessarily inflationary. It would be mildly growth enhancing. But of course, there is a risk that all that investment, in particular being driven by the public sector, crowds out other productive investment. And in that case, it would be less productivity enhancing and more inflationary, which we think is the more realistic case here for Europe. 
we don't think that this is the end of the world in terms of inflation, but we do estimate a sizable impact of around 20 basis points per year that inflation could turn out to be higher. That all being said, if electricity prices can be reliably and durably lowered, that would have the potential to generate more innovation. Rob, you have your finger on the pulse of new technology. What do you see emerging that may advance the progress of Europe's transition? Yeah, thanks, Jens. So historically, we've been positively surprised by the pace of levelized cost of energy coming down, particularly in renewables. And we've also been positively surprised by technological developments elsewhere. As we think about the key challenge of this new wind and solar capacity ambitions, the key is intermittency. And therefore, industrial scale batteries are going to be key. Fuel cells could also be green gas, which is also needed for industrial abatement, could also be part of that solution. I also think we need to talk about behind the meter, which is really rooftop solar, whether it's solar panels, but more crucially, one of the parts of the value chain is the inverters. More efficient inverters are one of the most key components for reducing the cost of solar. As we think about electrification of the home in terms of heat pumps, you know, there's another technology which will develop, and also passenger vehicles with moving to electric. This behind the meter rooftop solar generation will be important combined with batteries. And as I said, the inverters are a key part of that. Also will be software, how to manage all of this. Demand side response, I think is something you're going to hear much more from many of the retail companies we cover and innovating in the space. Now, as we think about the sequence and the steps of decarbonization, you know, step one, decarbonizes the existing power system. Step two, electrify as much as possible. Step three, move to green gases. We will eventually reach an area whereby we cannot decarbonize any further. And that's where carbon capture and storage comes in, for which we're already seeing significant improvement. So there's many technologies which I think will play a significant role in this. And I suspect, despite the current pressures we're seeing at the moment, we will continue to see significant positive surprises over the coming decade and thereafter, not withstanding that the cost of capital is, of course, higher than it was over the last decade. So which sectors are likely to benefit in the near term and in the longer term? So the obvious answer and somewhat self-serving is utilities. To that number you mentioned earlier of 5 billion spend, we also think that the utilities could probably contribute around a European utility in Europe, around one and a half to two trillion of this. That still leaves a sizable gap versus what you were talking, and perhaps there is upside risk to these investment spends. But within utilities, the obvious route is renewables. Having a tough time, I would say, in 2023, trapped within higher costs and capital costs, but also you know, policy impasse. But if we separate the wood for the trees, under the vast majority of scenarios out to 2030 and 2050, the increase in green electricity is going to be substantial. And utilities are the natural developers of those assets as they migrate away from coal and some degree gas into clean energy. But it's not the only area. There's also networks. We need to invest in distribution and transmission in electricity to actually accommodate these renewables and connect the new areas of upstream electricity generation to the areas of demand, which is primarily the cities and industry. Speaking about industry, there's also a need for green gas. And I actually think other sectors are going to contribute here, most notably oil and gas, which has the technical expertise and, of course, the industrial plant for industrial gases. As we look into the supply chains, another area that's been in focus this year, both the OEMs in terms of turbines and solar manufacturers, the cabling, the software, the heat pumps. I think there are many aspects within the equity stories which ancillary to utilities, but could create different risk rewards and different opportunities to what you may find in my sector. I think we can both agree that while significant progress has been made, Europe still has a long way to go for the next step of this journey. I fully agree. I would say that not all hope is lost, that current targets will be met, but there are headwinds that cannot be denied. Jens, thank you very much for taking the time to talk today. Thanks, Rob. It was great to speak with you. And thank you all for listening. Subscribe to Thoughts on the Market on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And please leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. The preceding content is informational only and based on information available when created. It is not an offer or solicitation, nor is it tax or legal advice. It does not consider your financial circumstances and objectives and may not be suitable for you.